<clears throat> started recording you. Let me know when to start. You can start. Okay. Hello, everyone, again. <laughs> um, so we're going to be talking about our periods this evening. And I've titled this presentation, Period Party, Celebrating Your Womanhood. And um, I knew that I wanted to, to do a presentation on this topic, but it was really hard to find the right title for it. And I really wanted this presentation to be about us celebrating our womanhood and celebrating you know, the different aspects of our womanhood. So again, here's the disclaimer. Uh, the information here is just for general information and please speak to your doctor before you make any changes. So is your period a blessing or a curse? So I shared my story about, you know, being in school and really wanting my period to come because it's a sign that you're growing up, you're getting more mature. And, but well, other people would say, you know, you might not really want your period to come because once it comes, it never ends, I guess, until menopause, right? And then that's something that I had to experience on my own. And I never really, I can't remember having a positive experience um, as it relates to my period. So when I think of, you know, my period being a curse or from what I've heard from other people, I think about shame, you know? So I mentioned earlier, you know, being embarrassed if you were to get up and have a red spot on your dress or your skirt or your pants, right? Feeling uncomfortable depending on the types of conversations you're having or even just feeling uncomfortable in your body when you don't even know, you know, what's going on, especially, you know, if it's like your first time having your period, not knowing what to expect. Um, there are certain words that are associated um, with having your period. So like on a flow, it's almost like, you know, this doomsday thing, like that's coming to get you and you can't avoid it, right? Or you're doomed until menopause. Or they usually say, um, it's that time of the month, right? And they use that, or usually other people use that to um, excuse certain behaviors or to kind of like look down on you and basically say, you know, you can't do any better because it's that time of the month. And another aspect of having our periods is, you know, sometimes we just wish they would go away and never, ever come back. So this conversation that I want to have this evening is about us accepting that this is a part of our womanhood and trying to navigate how to um, accept it and enjoy this part of our lives. So <clears throat> our menstrual cycle is actually known as the fifth vital sign. So if any of you have ever been to the emergency room or you know, in an urgent care situation, there are certain things they normally check first, right? They'll check your temperature, they'll check your blood pressure, your heart rate, your breathing rate. So those are normally called your vitals, your vital signs. And they can tell you so much information. They can tell you if you, know, you have an issue with your heart or if you're gonna have an infection or it tells you, you know, if you have a fever or what's going on with your lungs, like so much information you can gather just from those four tests. But if you think about your period and your menstrual cycle, you can also gain so much information from it. And I've just listed a few of the things here. So it can tell you about your thyroid, your digestive health, your stress levels, your mental health, it can tell you about anemia and other reproductive disorders like endometriosis, polycystic ovarian syndrome, tells you if you're pregnant, you know, that's usually the one everyone knows about. And then when it's gone, you know, it lets you know that you're, you're um, into menopause. So these are just some of the things that um, we can gain from our uh, periods. So as we go through this presentation, these are some of the things that I want us to think about. We're going to talk about education. You know, last time I said this is about education, not condemnation. You know, the more you know is the more you'll be able to help yourself, right? And you'll know the questions to ask, the things that you need to do in order to allow you to get better. 
self-awareness is also important. You know, no one knows your body more than you. And so if you want to get better, if you want to be in full, complete health, you need to be listening to your body. You need to know, you know, when is my period coming? How long is my cycle? How long do I bleed for? How many pads do I typically go through or tampons? You know, when does my PMS typically start? You know, and this is not just limited to, you know, your period. This is, this is in relation to all aspects of our health. Um, I included cognitive behavioral therapy there. Some people might need to go through some uh, behavioral changes in order to cope with whatever menstrual symptoms they're going through. So this is not for everyone. It's just for a particular subset of the population. We're also going to talk about some diet things that you can do lifestyle changes, botanicals, so those are plants that you can incorporate, and some supplements at the end. So, of course, we need to go through the basics, right? I'm just minimizing this here. Okay, so here we're looking at our menstrual cycle, right? So the typical cycle is zero to 28 days that you see here at the bottom. And in the middle of the cycle at day 14 is normally what we call ovulation. So we're gonna start by looking at this top section here. And this is called the ovarian cycle because this is what happens in the ovaries. Now the ovarian cycle is made of two phases, the follicular phase. So this is a follicle here. So the follicle is growing and maturing. So that's why it's the follicular phase. Ovulation happens in the middle at day 14. This is when the egg is released. And then the second half of the ovarian cycle is called the luteal phase. And it's called the luteal phase because once this egg is released, what's left behind turns into this structure here, which is called the corpus luteum. And this corpus luteum releases a hormone called progesterone, right? So before I continue with that part, on this side in the follicular phase, we typically have more estrogen and I'm gonna show that in the next picture. And then the luteal phase, we have more progesterone. So let's look at the next picture. So here again is our ovarian cycle and it's broken up into the follicular phase. We have our ovulation happening in the middle and the luteal phase. So if we look here, here's our legend. This is estrogen. So this blue line here. So first you have your period and your period is day one. The first day that you bleed is day one. And our estrogen levels are pretty low. And then between days five to seven, your estrogen starts to increase. And this point at which the estrogen starts increasing is when the follicle that we saw in the previous picture starts growing and changing to form an egg, right? So the estrogen increases, increases, increases. And then as the estrogen increases, we have another hormone that comes on the scene this one is called luteinizing hormone. So this luteinizing hormone is this orange one here and it peaks and once it peaks, then we have ovulation. So ovulation, the egg is released and then our estrogen falls, our luteinizing hormone falls. And then in the luteal phase, like we mentioned earlier, we have our corpus luteum this corpus luteum is gonna make progesterone. So progesterone is our purple line here. So here we see our progesterone increasing. Now progesterone is the progestation hormone. That means it's gonna prepare the body for, um, for the fertilized egg. So we'll see more of that in the uterine cycle. So now let's look at what's happening in the uterus. So we'll look at the bottom part and the inner lining of the uterus is called the endometrium, right? 
So the first five to seven days, we have our menses or our period. And that's when the lining starts to break down. And as the lining break down, breaks down, you bleed, right? And then what happens is the next phase is the proliferative phase. So as the estrogen starts increasing, the estrogen is the builder. So the estrogen starts building up the uterus, building, 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 building. We get to day 14 where we have ovulation, the egg is released, we form our corpus luteum. The corpus luteum produces progesterone. So remember we said progesterone prepares the uterus um, for implantation of that fertilized egg. So this is called the secretory phase. And in this phase, the progesterone is like, I think of it as like doing the finishing touches on the uterus. So, you know, if you're building a house, you build, build, build. And then once everything is built, you kind of put in the furniture, you put in the flowers, you decorate. That's kind of what uh, progesterone does to the uterine lining. And then that happens until we get to day 28. So here, we're gonna look at the hormones now. So uterine cycle. So we're at, um, let's start at the beginning. So we said day one is the first day that you bleed and you bleed for about five to seven days. Then our estrogen is our blue line. Estrogen starts increasing. And as estrogen increases, because it's the builder, your uterine lining starts to build and it builds and it builds until day 14. And then we have progesterone that comes on the scene. Progesterone increases after you ovulate and progesterone now is gonna do the finishing touches on the uterine lining it's gonna you know, increase the blood supply, make it really thick, so that if that egg is fertilized, the egg will have a place to stay and grow. So those are the two parts of the menstrual cycle. The ovarian cycle, where we just focus on the ovaries, the uterine cycle, where we just focus on the uterus, but both of these are happening at the same time. So let's just go a little bit deeper into what happens during our menses. So this um, picture here is just showing some characteristics of a healthy period. So let's start on this side. We have three to seven days of bleeding. Ideally, you do wanna, you wanna have more than three, okay? Um, less than three days of spotting right before or after your flow, right? It's like, you know, the body's getting ready to bleed. So a little bit of spotting is okay. Your period arrives every 25 to 35 days. Ideally, we want it to be 28 to 30 days. So what is the consistency? The consistency should be like maple syrup without clots or clumps, okay? Ideally, on average, it should be about 35 to 50 milliliters of total blood loss. So throughout those five to seven days, this is the amount of blood that you should be losing. Um, you can have very little cramping that is uh, considered normal and saturated red color. That's the color of, um, that's the color that you want, a, a saturated deep red color. So this picture here, is just showing um, normal amount of pads or tampons that you know you would go through during a cycle. So normal would be six to ten pads for those, let's say five to seven days. If you have a light flow, it'll be about one to five um, pads. And if you have a heavy flow, it could be 16 plus pads. So ideally you wanna be in this range, right? Six to 10 pads or tampons um, for every five to seven days. Now let's talk about ovulation. So we mentioned that ovulation happens in the middle of the cycle, typically at day 14, right? So we wanna talk about 
how can you know if you're ovulating? Because if you're ovulating optimally, then you will release enough progesterone, right? And progesterone is that hormone that, you know, it puts you in a good mood, you know, you're not as stressed or anxious. So we do want to have, you know, enough of that hormone. So one way that you can check to see if you're ovulating is checking your temperature. So the way you would do this is you would check your temperature every morning right as you wake up, right? So here we have the first part of the cycle. Here are our days. So day one, days one to 14, well, this person ovulates at day 17. So we start at day one and we see, you know, the temperature fluctuates, 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 and that's normal, right? But when ovulation happens and we release progesterone, progesterone is a warming hormone. So that means that when progesterone is released, your body temperature goes up. And so you'll be able to measure that on a thermometer, right? So here we see the little spike in the temperature right after ovulation. And that spike is also going to be in line with the increase in progesterone that we see in this graph here. So this is in degrees Celsius because that's what I know. But I also included a picture in Fahrenheit for my American friends. And it's basically the same thing, right? Um, day one to 17, this person ovulates on day 17. So we see the temperature fluctuations up, down, up, down. And then after you ovulate, you see that increase in temperature because of the release of progesterone. So another way that you can check to see if you're ovulating is by checking your cervical fluid or your cervical mucus. Um, this might not be for everyone, so it's okay if you don't want to um, try this, but your cervical mucus changes depending on where you are in your cycle, right? So um, in the early follicular phase, so the first um, 14 days of your cycle, you can have dry uh, vaginal uh, sensation or little to no uh, cervical fluid, right? So you can see, you know, it's very sparse there. Getting closer to the middle, mid follicular phase as estrogen starts to rise, it gets a bit wetter, right? When you ovulate, it's slippery and stretchy and stringy. So it looks exactly like this picture here. Right. And then after ovulation, it becomes thicker and sticky. So um, if you don't want to insert your fingers to check your cervical mucus, you could just check the tissue when you wipe and see if you see any um, changes there. If you're interested in trying this. Another um, way that you can tell if you're ovulating is by checking the cervix itself. So when you're not ovulating, so days one to 14, your cervix is low and it's usually hard and closed, right? But when you're ovulating, your cervix is high, soft, and open. And I, when I learned about this, I was like, wow, this is so cool. Your cervix actually moves. And so what they say is that, because when you're ovulating, you're releasing progesterone, right? And then the progesterone is going to start, you know, doing the finishing touches on your uterus, preparing for a baby, right? Or not necessarily the baby, but for the fertilized egg, right? But how will the egg become fertilized, right? There needs to be sexual intercourse. So one, one um, thing that I read was that this, where's my cursor? The cervix goes up to allow enough space for the penis. It's open to allow easier uh, transport of the sperm, right? So I just thought that was really cool that your cervix actually moves, your cervical mucus actually changes throughout your cycle. So if you're interested, you can actually just try it at home. When you do it at first, it might be, um, you might not know what you're feeling because you know it's the first time. 
But what I would suggest is try it for a full cycle, right? And document it. You know, there are certain apps that you can use and you could just fill it in. Um, I use the app called the Clue app and you could just add whatever parameters you want to add to it. But this is just a way for you to, you know, start understanding your body. And so if you are interested, when you do um, insert your fingers, well, you could insert one or two fingers, but it's good to know the measurement. So let's say I inserted my index finger and let's say this is my cervix and, and um, let's say this mark here is my vulva. So that's another thing. Your external genitalia, so what you see on the outside is called your vulva, right? But what's inside is the vagina. So, you know, it's just a way for us to get the, um, the terms correct. So if you were to insert your finger and the top is at your cervix, you can kind of measure where your vulva lands, right? Where, you're, where, the, where your finger is at the outside. And you can say, okay. And you can just use um, these marks here just to let you know how high or how low your cervix is. If you wanna try it, that's great. If you choose not to try it, that's great as well. So let's talk about a little bit more about these hormones. So estrogen. So we know that estrogen is important for developing our secondary sex characteristics. So that includes our curviness, our breasts, our hips, our lips. That's all because of estrogen. It's also important for building our uterine lining. So we said, you know, estrogen is the builder. Estrogen is also good for our bones. It's good for our brain. So it helps with our moods as well. It's good for our heart and it causes the body to store fat. Progesterone. So like we said, progesterone is made in the ovaries after you form that corpus luteum, but it's also made in the placenta. So if that egg becomes fertilized and the egg becomes, um, and that fertilized egg becomes implanted and you know, the baby starts growing, the body makes a placenta, the placenta actually takes over uh, producing the progesterone. So it helps to maintain pregnancy, it helps to keep you calm and enjoying life, and it reduces anxiety. So some people don't know that we also make androgens, and in this case, I'm talking about testosterone. So we do make a small amount of testosterone, and testosterone is important for our libido, it can help with our mood, helps with motivation and the hair distribution, especially if it's um, imbalanced. So now that we have a bit of background about the menstrual cycle and uh, the different hormones that are at play, let's um, talk a little bit about premenstrual syndrome or PMS. And so I know that PMS is something that a lot of women um, have to deal with on a regular basis. And the thing to understand with PMS is that it usually occurs during the luteal phase, which we know is after day 14, right? And it disappears or significantly regresses by the end of menstruation. So remember menstruation is when you bleed, right? So day one is the first day that you bleed. And if you stop bleeding on day five, you would expect your PMS to end at day five or before that. So I actually wanted to quickly just ask you guys, you know, what are some PMS symptoms that you, oh no, we're recording, never mind. Oh no, this is in general. So you don't have to give me your particular PMS symptom, but what are some PMS symptoms that you know about? Where's my other, okay. If anyone wants to start, or you know what, I'll just look in the chat, just type it in the chat and I'll just type out some of the symptoms that I see here, okay. I see vomiting, weight gain, okay, cravings. 
Okay, anything? Oh, irritability. What else? Bloating. Breast tenderness. Anything? Oh, sleepiness. Body pains. Body pains. Okay, let me move this over here. All right, what else? Headaches. Low mood. Crying. Cramps. Dizzy spells. Mm -hmm. Going to the bathroom all the time. Maybe let's call that loose stools. Yeah, diarrhea. Diarrhea. Well, I guess that could go with loose stools. And I'll take one more. One more just to finish off our list here. Constipation. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. How do I? Okay, I'll close that. Yeah, so if you notice here, we have a wide range of symptoms, right? Some of them are physical symptoms like vomiting or um, you know, constipation, but then others of them are more mental emotional symptoms. So crying, low mood, you know? And so this is just an example of the broad range of symptoms that you can actually have with PMS. You know, I read somewhere where you can have up to 150 symptoms with PMS. Why? Because we're all different, right? And so each of us um, are, are more susceptible to different things based on our lifestyle and our diet and all these things. So thank you so much for, you know, all these, um, all these symptoms that we experience with PMS. Now, some people categorize PMS into four categories, and we're going to go through them, but I just want you to know that this is almost like an oversimplification of, you know, PMS symptoms. And when I list them, you might realize that you're in more than one category, right? But just remember that this is an oversimplification just to help us, you know, get an idea of what's going on. So we have PMS A, which is typically, which is associated with anxiety, PMS C associated with cravings, PMS H, hydration, and PMS D, depression. So let's go through these. So PMS A, anxiety, and this is usually related to low progesterone. So what are some of the symptoms? We have tension, feeling out of control, palpitations, cramping, back pain, hostility, irritability, fatigue, mood swings, foggy thinking. So these are some of the symptoms that you can present with if you have PMSA anxiety. PMSC for cravings, this one is usually due to low androgens. So you have hypoglycemia, fainting spells or lightheadedness. You can also have heart palpitations with this one, headaches, increased appetite, you crave sweets and salty foods, insomnia, mood changes, poor memory, concentration and focus, and fatigue. Oops, the next one, hydration. This is usually due to high androgens. So you can have anger, irritability, or increased interpersonal conflicts. You can have GI or gastrointestinal bloating, you can have breast congestion, nostalgia, or breast tenderness, water retention, acne or oily skin, swelling of the hands and the, the feet and the ankles, or weight gain due to the water retention. And then we have PMSD or PMS depression, usually due to low estrogen, and it can cause depressed mood, feelings of hopelessness, Decreased interest in work, school, and hobbies, difficulty concentrating, sleepiness, insomnia, clumsiness, forgetfulness, fatigue, and mood changes. And so if you notice, some of these actually overlap with each other. And you might have looked through the list and realized, whoa, I have some symptoms from this one, some symptoms from that one. And so like I said earlier, it's kind of an oversimplification, but it sort of helps people figure out which one is the main one, which one is the, the, the one that aggravates me the most. And that can sort of help you figure out, okay, where should I focus on first? 
and then you know help you to move forward from there so i'm just going to take a sip so period party the party is about to start because now we're going to actually get into what are the things that we can do to help reduce some of these pms symptoms that we're having so the first thing on the list here is exercise i mean we know that exercise is important for so many different diseases so many different conditions but it can also be beneficial um, when you're going through pms and this is um, not just exercise when you're on your period but exercising throughout your cycle which would be the entire month right and so exercise can help to boost your mood, increase your energy, and just increase, you know, blood flow and blood circulation. We know exercise also increases the blood flow to your pelvis. And so we know that once there's more circulation, then we can get more of the inflammation and the inflammatory markers out and bring more nutrients and oxygen to that area. Some things in our lifestyle that might worsen PMS smoking can worsen PMS and drinking alcohol can make our PMS symptoms worse. So it's best to avoid those things. And last week we spoke about, you know, alcohol and how that um, affects our digestion as well. So diet, diet is so important. I mean, it's important for every, for every health condition because we want to be fully and completely in health. So we want to eat complex carbohydrates. So what do I mean by that? We want to eat our vegetables. We want to eat our potatoes. We want to eat our, you know, brown rice and our healthy grains. We want to avoid the simple carbohydrates, you know, all the sugary snacks and the, the fried foods. Avoid the high sodium foods because when we have too much sodium, you know, that can also potentially lead to some of that bloating that you might experience. We want to avoid caffeine, especially if you have that um, anxiety picture. And um, caffeine is a stimulant, right? And it can just increase that and make you even more anxious and more tense, right? So in order to have a balanced diet, we mentioned the carbohydrates, but we want to make sure that we're having sufficient protein in our diets and healthy fats. And, you know, once we've balanced out our meals, then that can really help us to balance our hormones. So another important thing when it comes to diet is our blood sugar balance. So when we eat, here is, you know, a candy, but when we eat those simple carbs, you know, candy or lots of junk food and processed food, it, it spikes our blood sugar. So our blood sugar levels go really, really high. And then what does our body do? The body's like, okay, we need to make a lot of insulin. So your body makes a whole lot of insulin to deal with all this blood sugar, right? And then because you've made a lot of insulin, your blood sugar like drops like really fast. And you're like, oh no, your body's like, we need more sugar, we need more sugar. Why? Because when you made too much insulin, it dropped your blood sugar too low. And then you keep going through this cycle up and down, up and down. So how can we ensure that our blood sugar remains balanced? Well, before we get there, here are some signs that you might have unbalanced blood sugar levels. If you have crazy energy highs, and crazy crashes. Um, another thing could be sugar and caffeine cravings, feelings of extreme hunger and thirst, trouble falling asleep, or you're waking up, um, or difficulty waking up in the morning, moodiness, anxiety. So those are just some signs that you could have, you know, unbalanced blood sugar. But when you have balanced blood sugars, this is what you have on the other end of the spectrum. You'll have consistent energy throughout the day and no major energy crashes. You'll have less cravings for sweets and sugar and caffeine. You'll be able to sleep properly. You'll have enough energy to last you throughout the day and you'll have stable moods. And I'm sure, you know, this is something that we definitely want. So what can we do again to balance our blood sugars? 
So we want to eat the right food. So we want to eat our fruits, eat our vegetables. We want to have our complex carbohydrates that we mentioned earlier, but we want to have set meal times. And if we eat a balanced meal at set meal times, then that means that our blood sugar levels aren't going to spike as much because the protein that we mentioned earlier and the fat, they um, help to slow down the um, release of glucose in the blood so that you don't get that you know, blood sugar spike. So the glucose is released slowly. So that means that you have more energy over a longer period of time and that will help to balance your blood sugar levels. Exercise is also another way to help to balance those blood sugar levels because when you exercise, it actually opens up those little transporters to allow the glucose to come into the cell. So that's another way that we can balance our hormones or balance our blood sugar levels. Um, let's talk about, oh wait, before we move on, I guess I, I must have taken it out. But when it comes to diet, um, another important thing when it comes to balancing our hormones is ensuring that we have good digestion. So it's not only good to eat the right foods, but we need to make sure that the waste is coming out as well. So our livers actually metabolizes or breaks down extra hormones, especially our estrogen. So we want to make sure that our liver is working properly so that the extra estrogen is broken down. But if you're not going to the bathroom regularly, like one to three times a day that we spoke about last week, then that extra estrogen that's trying to leave is going to get reabsorbed in your body. And then you're going to have extra, extra hormones that should have been leaving. So it's not only important to eat the right foods, but we also want to make sure that our liver is working properly and that our colon is working properly to get the waste out. All right. Botanicals. So these are just some plants um, to consider. Uh, there's one called Vitex agnus castus, or it's called chase tree or chaseberry. That's um, a popular hormone that is used with PMS. Dandelion leaf, that's usually used um, for like bloating. Hypericum perforatum, that's St. John's warts. That one can be used if you have um, more of the depression symptoms. And passion flower, that's really good for anxiety and insomnia. Um, I haven't said much about these herbs because these are things that you need to speak to your doctor about, okay? Before you consider it, speak to your doctor. Some supplements that have shown to be, that have been shown to be helpful with PMS, calcium supplement um, and vitamin D. So we know that um, calcium means vitamin D to be absorbed. And we know that especially if you live in, you know, North American countries, you know, a lot of people might be vitamin D deficient. So it's always a good idea to get your vitamin D levels checked um, or speak to your doctor about your vitamin D levels. Uh, vitamin B6 has also been shown to help with uh, PMS symptoms as well as magnesium. So we know that magnesium is a muscle relaxant. So it you know, can help to ease and relieve some of the pain. If you're not one for supplements, I know... There's something called magnesium flakes. You can actually buy that and um, make a magnesium spray. And sometimes what I would do, you would make the spray. So you would use a one-to-one -one ratio. So let's say you have one cup of the flakes and one cup of the water. And you would actually pour, the water has to be boiled. So you pour the hot water on the magnesium flakes and the magnesium flakes just dissolve. And then you let it cool. You put it in a little spray bottle and um, uh, just before your period or while you're on your period, you can just spray it on um, the area that you have the pain. You just rub it in and um, that helps to relieve some of the pain as well. So we are coming down to the end. 
So I know we talked about PMS and a lot of the things we can do for PMS, but we really want an um, full and complete health, right? And so what are other things that we can do to help not just with PMS, but with our health in general so that we can achieve balance? Pure air, it's so important for us to get fresh air. And especially if you have that PMS um, anxiety picture, you know, it's good to just take a break every now and then go outside and take some deep breaths that can be very relaxing. Vitamin D is important. We have vitamin D receptors on almost every cell in our body. So it's very important to get your sunlight. If you're not able to get your sunshine, get a vitamin D supplement and you can speak to your doctor about that. Temperance. So we want to have, we want to be moderate in the good things and we want to get rid of the bad things. So we talked about some of that with the food and the lifestyle um, changes that we want to make. Rest. Rest is very important because when we rest, that's when our body replenishes itself and heals itself. And um, we also spoke about exercise. We spoke about proper diet, water. It's always good to stay hydrated. I mean, 80%, 70 to 80% of the body is made up of water, right? So we really need to ensure that we're drinking enough water, staying hydrated, and that will just help to flush things out. Last week, we spoke about how water is really good to help with um, our bowel movements, right? And the last one on the list is trust in divine power. You know, God made us so beautifully. And even though, you know, we have our periods and we have this pain, you know, we can trust God and say, show me what it is that I need to be doing in order to have full and complete health. And, you know, by educating yourself, by being, you know, going to different seminars and speaking to your doctor, you know, he will allow those things to be revealed to you. Okay, so we started this presentation talking about our periods being a curse, right? Or having the experience of it being a curse. But let's think, can we potentially come up with some reasons for it to be a blessing? And so this is what I came up with. It tells you what's going on with your health. So at the beginning, I said, you know, our menstrual cycle can tell you about your thyroid health. It can tell you about the health of your GI tract, right? It can tell you about your liver. It can tell you, you know, if you're pregnant, if you're going through menopause, like so many things. If you're, if you're anemic, right? It can tell you so many things. And so if we can start looking at our periods as a way to see what's going on in our body, we can see it as a blessing. Another reason, it empowers you to be the expert on your body. So like I mentioned earlier, no one knows your body more than yourself. And so one of the things you can do is start tracking your period, start, you know, being aware of what's going on in your body, start writing things down, you know, when do I get a stomach ache, you know, how many pads do I use, you know, those simple questions can give you a lot of insight into your menstrual cycle. If you know what's wrong, you will know how to fix it, right? But the only way you can know what's wrong is if you're aware of what's going on. It is a way for us as women to bond. And, you know, if we didn't have our menstrual cycles, we wouldn't be having this conversation tonight. So, you know, it is a way for women to bond and to discuss. And, and I mean, even growing up, like I remember some conversations that I had with my mom and I remember this book that she gave me to read about my period. And if I had any questions, you know, I would ask her and she would explain it to me. So it's a, it's a way for mothers and daughters to bond. It's a way for women in general to bond. And uh, I mean, the two last things I put here, it lets you know you're not pregnant, right? If you're not trying to get pregnant. And another amazing, wonderful thing is we have the ability to bring life into this world. And so even though when you experience your period, you might be, oh, I really want this to end. You know, when it ends, it might be an even bigger blessing of having a child. So those are just some of the blessings that I thought of um, when it comes to, you know, why is your period important? 
And I just made a little short list here of, you know, some self-care things that you can do during those times of PMS leading up to your period. So you can consider drinking a relaxing tea. You know, if a hot water bottle works for you, ensure that you always have that on hand. Some people enjoy taking baths or doing dry skin brushing. That can be very relaxing. Or if you have the luxury to get a massage. Or, you know, some people just need to have some quiet time just to be alone with their thoughts. And that's fine, too. You can read a book, journal. And while you journal, you could also include, you know, your emotions, what you're feeling, you know, the changes you want to make. And another thing here, it's important to smile. You know, even though you might be going through a hard time, it might be painful. Sometimes just smiling can, even if it's for a couple seconds, can, you know, relieve some of the stress and tension that you're feeling. And the last thing I have here is do something fun, whatever that means for you, calling a friend, you know, watching a funny video, you know, whatever that means for you um, is something that I think, you know, you can incorporate. So how can we celebrate our womanhood when it comes to our periods? And it starts with you, right? And it starts with you trying to figure out what does this look like for me, right? I know what it looks like for me, but what does it look like for you? And I hope that this presentation, although it was, I think it was short. Okay, well, not that short, but um, I really hope that, you know, this will empower you to probably think about your period in a different light and, you know, consider having more conversations about this with other women if they are, you know, open to having those conversations with you, because the more you learn is um, the better able you'll be able to share with others and, you know, help figure out your own concerns as well. So that is the end. I hope that you enjoyed it. And um, yeah, and I hope that you learned something as well.